My name is John Lennox. I'm an Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford. And I'm also an Emeritus Fellow both in Mathematics and Philosophy of Science at Green Templeton College, Oxford. And in my retirement, I really concentrate in the area of writing and speaking on the interface between science, philosophy and theology. Research in pure mathematics, why does it matter to others, is a very hard question to answer because in pure mathematics, often pure mathematicians are solving problems that arise out of applied mathematics and engineering so that the practical applications are very far down the line. And the odd thing about pure mathematics is many of the things that appear to people to be very abstract and at first sight irrelevant turned out to be absolutely fundamental. For example, the construction of a number system that included the square root of minus one would at one time have seen absolutely impossible. But now it's fundamental to all electronics, engineering, and so on and so forth. So we never know exactly what applications are going to come out. And some of the most famous mathematical problems, it's a bit like saying, why would you want to climb Everest? Well, because it's there is a fairly sensible answer. We want to know the solutions to some of the problems that have puzzled people's minds for centuries. Oh, well, my research now I don't do any more pure mathematics and my work in the interface of science, philosophy and theology matters a great deal because there you're dealing with the big questions, the questions of existence, what is ultimate reality, is there a God, what is behind this universe, is there life after death, what is the meaning of life. These are the deep questions that everybody asks at some time or another and I'm very interested in what people have to say and answer to them because as a committed Christian I want to go out there into the public space and expose my reasons for faith in God and allow people to question me and also get to know why they think what they think and try to come up with answers to their views. And in my life that has resulted in confirming my faith as a Christian many times over. It depends what kind of atheist you're talking to because atheism comes in various brands and not everybody is an extreme militant atheist like Richard Dawkins or the late Christopher Hitchens. But it has an appeal to people, I think, for a number of reasons. First of all, they link it very closely with science and claim that science is the only way to truth and science actually is essentially atheistic in its attitude. So if you want to be regarded as an intelligent person, you need to be an atheist. And that appeals to people who know very little about the history of science and very little about actually the nature of atheism. And I want to challenge that and say, actually, you think that atheism is a rational belief system. I don't think it is. And I think it is essentially anti-scientific. Whereas you think that Christianity is an irrational belief system that's anti-scientific. And I want to say, no. Christianity is a highly rational belief system and actually it was Christianity that gave birth to modern science as we know it because the pioneers of modern science they believed in an intelligent creator behind the universe and therefore they believed science could be done so there's a very close tie up and the trouble is myths get around in the popular mind and flavor of the day and Dawkins was one of those flavors of the day. But I think there's a moral dimension to it as well. 
Huxley, I think it was one of the Huxleys who said what, how marvelous it was to discover that there's no God because then he could live as he liked. And I think people have deep misunderstandings about the nature of God that he's somehow against them and against them enjoying life and threatens them with all kinds of things. So there's an instinct of fear of God. So if you can remove God from the equation, people feel apparently a great deal happier. And I want to deal with those kind of myths as well. That's a huge question because obviousness is a relative term. I'm a mathematician. Somebody comes up to me and they say this and that and the that, and I say, yes, well, that's quite obvious. It won't be obvious to you because it depends on prior knowledge and what we presuppose. And in some ways, I find various aspects of Christianity extremely obvious because if there is a creator, who created this world and has left his fingerprints in the laws of nature and our mathematical understanding of them, then uh, to my mind, the most obvious thing to ask is, well, has this creator spoken? Are we in any sense reflecting the image of the creator? But other people, if they're coming from a different worldview perspective, it won't be obvious so that your question falls in a vacuum because it's person specific and I can't answer for every person in the world. So it's a big question, but it's only a big question because you can't just specify all the different levels of obviousness or non-obviousness. So I want to say, who's the person asking me if it's obvious or not, or why isn't it obvious? Replacing Christianity by vague spirituality appeals to people because it makes no moral demands whatsoever. You see, being a Christian means following Christ. And Christ makes demands, and some of them are moral demands, and they make us uncomfortable. They require obedience. And if you can dissipate that into some cloudy, nebulous, lovey-dovey spirituality, that suits people because they don't want moral demands made on them. Another thing is this, that I want to confront reality. And someone who says the resurrection is a metaphor, simply I say a metaphor for what? Because as C.S. Lewis pointed out a long time ago, metaphors are always metaphors for something real. What is the reality? And of course, anastasis in Greek, the Greek word for resurrection, means a literal rising up again of a body. So they're fighting against the very grammar, as well as, I believe, fighting against the historical evidence that Jesus did rise from the dead. But one can understand that vague spirituality and religion, where everything dissolves into a nebulous, comfortable zone that's almost like a narcotic for the mind. That appeals to people, but it's got no intellectual rigidity or robustness. And it's not really livable in the end, because it doesn't help people when they hit the big questions of life, when they hit broken relationships, deep suffering, problems of death, then it disappears like snow in front of a flamethrower. Religion without God, spirituality without God. I think part of what drives that is that there's a deep realization, be precisely because we're actually made in the image of God, whether we believe it or not, there's a deep sense that there must be more than this physical stuff. There must be more. Where can we find something more? Now, that's a very good intuition. I just think many of these people don't go far enough. Their more is some kind of spirituality that links things together in a non-precise, non-demanding sense that makes them feel comfortable with, well, I'm connected. That's a phrase that you hear all the time. It comes from the internet. 
they're connected, their meaning is to be found in their Facebook friends and Instagram and all the rest of it. And I suspect the spirituality they're talking about is almost like a spirit in the internet, you know. <laughs> it's it's a, a very odd phenomenon and it gives people a little step feeling that, look, I'm trying to make a bit of sense out of what's going on in the universe. I haven't got very far, but I'm comfortable with this. And it's not like dogmatic religion, and it's not fundamentalist, and it's not scary for people. And all of those kind of things combine, I feel, to make people latch on to this. But again, it doesn't work when the big issues come up. We need more than that. But it's a start. Artificial intelligence has become a huge industry and it's got many aspects to it. And there are aspects that I wish to respond to as a philosopher, a Christian and a scientist. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding out there in the public, first of all, about the good things that narrow AI is actually doing and one wants to applaud the people that are working in those fields to produce, for example, faster, more accurate medical diagnoses and so on. And then you begin to move further into the use, the current use of equipment that raises huge ethical problems. And one of the main things that most of us are aware of is the use of surveillance cameras and the huge amount of data that's being generated and what's done with it. And you can see on the plus side, it can be used to fight crime and catch criminals. On the other hand, it can be used as a surveillance mechanism. And we see that very much in Xinjiang among the Uyghur people, where it seems to be being used to control a culture and eventually destroy it. So. The Big Brother scenario of George Orwell is already with us. And therefore, and these are things that are already happening. This isn't the sci-fi hype. So there are two sides to narrow AI, which by which I mean the capacity to do a single thing well that's normally done by human intelligence. So AI in terms of computing power decouples intelligence from consciousness and that's a, a hugely interesting topic. But then there's the other side and my book starts off by investigating the work by Noah, Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus, where he is very keen as are some others on the idea that the big agenda for the 21st century, this is compressing his argument, is one, to solve the problem of physical death. It's just a technical problem in his view and we shall solve it. Secondly, to maximize human happiness by re-engineering human beings, either by implanting things into them or by uploading things from their minds onto silicon, all these kind of things that sound very futuristic, are packed full of science fiction, but have a huge appeal because of the film industry that has for a long time been playing around with these things. But not only that, because some leading scientists, like our Astronomer Royal in Great Britain, Lord Rees, who are making predictions that it won't be long before we'll have super intelligences. And I want to investigate this concept and where it's coming from historically and biblically. And that I attempt to do in this book. It would seem to me that many parts of the academia and media, naturalism, atheism, is almost by definition the default worldview. And so airtime in the UK, Dawkins gets a lot of it. But there's no real rational Christian debate to feed in. 
And my motivation for most of my life in my debates and writing is this, look, why don't we give the public a chance to hear that there is more than one credible worldview? And so I'm actively engaged in the rational defense of Christianity. I think my atheist friends, and I have many of them, have a right to come to the table. But it's when the table pushes everybody else out through political correctness, through dominant worldview assumptions and so on, that I feel we're getting into a very dangerous zone. And I wish to promote, let me put it this way, I debate people so that into the public space there comes a credible, what I hope is a credible alternative to atheism. But then let the audience make up their own minds. I'm not there to make up their mind or to ram anything down their throat, but to show them, look, here's an alternative. Compare the two and make your own mind up.